Good evening. The International Brotherhood of Teamsters, the nation's largest and perhaps most scandal-prone union, is back in the news. This week, the union convened a disciplinary panel to hear charges of corruption against President Frank Fitzsimmons. That the panel was even convened was considered something of a victory for the dissident group of rank-and-file Teamsters called PROD. In a 94-page bill of particulars, they demanded the removal of Fitzsimmons, alleging that he used union funds for a lavish lifestyle, appointed relatives to executive jobs, and allowed organized crime to infiltrate the union. Tonight, a look at the Teamsters, whose two million members in hundreds of jobs from truck drivers to college professors is the most powerful and most investigated union in the country. Jim Lehrer is off tonight. Charlene? Robin, as you said, this is neither the first nor the worst of the Teamsters' troubles. Two of the past three presidents were convicted and served time in jail. The most celebrated of those was Jimmy Hoffa, who served four years for jury tampering and mail fraud. And four years after his release from prison, while attempting to get a foot back in the door of the union, he disappeared and is believed dead. Trouble with the law has plagued other union officials, including Anthony Provenzano, the man Hoffa was to meet the day he disappeared. Provenzano, a local New Jersey official, was recently convicted of arranging a kickback on a Teamster pension fund loan. His trial on charges of murdering another local official has just been postponed. Within the past few months, the Labor Department has forced the resignations of all of the pension fund trustees, including Frank Fitzsimmons. Further, the government is investigating improper and negligent loans, including some to suspected organized crime figures. The dissident Teamsters, now seeking Fitzsimmons' removal, started as the Professional Drivers Council in 1971. Now called simply PROD, they claim to be the biggest and strongest rank-and-file reform movement in the country. Their recruiting literature says, our union is the wealthiest and most powerful in America, but it's also the most undemocratic and corrupt. Prod is based in Washington, and its research director is Robert Windrum. Mr. Windrum, could you give us in a little more detail Prod's main allegations against Mr. Fitzsimmons? Our allegations against Mr. Fitzsimmons relate to a wide variety of actions he has taken during the 11 years of his stewardship as president of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. In terms of the worst things that we can say, I would, I would expect that sweetheart contracts those contracts which are less than the National Master Freight Agreement, which is the Teamster's main contract. This we have found in, in various places to have been, in many, many ways, undercut. Some Teamster truck drivers in New Jersey, for example, are making $125 a week. Beyond that, though, there are other things that we're looking into. And what we're trying to do mainly is make the union as an institution and make the union as rank-and-file members face up to what has happened during Frank Fitzsimmons' stewardship of the union. Uh, there are certain irrefutable facts which may have been passed over in the procedural hearings that took place this week. Uh, among them, the irrefutable facts that the Teamster Central States Pension Fund has told the Labor Department that it has $37.8 million in loans that are uncollectible or in default, and another $178 million in loans that are classified as shaky. We've also found irrefutable facts to, to show that organized crime is continuing to infiltrate the union at a greater pace. For example, during the past year, three close associates of Teamster Vice Presidents, Jack Nardi in Cleveland, an associate of Jackie Presser, Salvatore Brigiulio in New Jersey, an associate of Sam Provenzano, and Mike Spiro in Kansas City, an associate of Roy Williams, have all been murdered gangland style. And these things are something that you can't ignore. And Beyond that, there are other irrefutable facts. The fact that Jimmy Hoffa is missing, the fact that he was going to visit Tony Pro that day. But probably the most irrefutable fact that we have with regard to the lack of a democratic union is the fact that no one here is, except for Mr. Ratner, representing Mr. Fitzsimmons. Mr. Fitzsimmons has, has deemed not to show up today. And that, of course, as we look around the room, is, is the most irrefutable fact. He fails to face his accusers. Let me ask you this. What result do you expect from the disciplinary panel which heard these allegations earlier this week? We are expecting justice. Uh, that's what we've been saying. We'd be pleasantly surprised if we, if we saw it. But the, a full hearing of these charges is, is something which is advantageous to the rank and file because it shows them what is going on in their union. I understand it's unprecedented to have a hearing like this in the union. Why do you suppose the executive decided to convene the panel? 
It's not exactly unprecedented. There was one in 1974 with oh. regard to Mr. Fitzsimmons' uh, contribution of $25,000 in union dues money to the Rabbi Korf Defense Committee for President Nixon. But this is the first time it's really ever dealt with the wide variety of Teamster corruption that has been alleged. H how many members does Prod have, Mr. Whitman? Currently we have 6,300 members who pay $20 a year in dues. Uh, why is it, why do you have so few members when you've been, you've had seven years to organize now, and if the union's in as bad shape as you say it is, why are not more of the two million members up in arms about it and joining you? Well, there's a variety of reasons for that, one of which is not that many uh, rank-and-file Teamsters are even aware of fraud. If Mr. Ratner, uh, through his client, would permit us to take a full-page ad in the International Teamster next month, uh, I'm sure that our membership would increase dramatically. Uh, there are other reasons. Uh, we started out as an over-the-road uh, truck driver uh, group. There are some people in other Teamster jurisdictions which do not particularly feel that they have the same economic interest, and we're trying to change that. Uh, and just the, the, in certain areas, for example, in New Jersey, uh, when I was a reporter before I took this job, uh, I sat down and talked with some rank and filers, and they were deathly afraid of doing this. They wouldn't give you uh, their, their name. You had to deal with them on a first name basis over the telephone or meet them through uh, a third party. And, and you know, there was no, there was no kidding around in, in, in that particular area of the country. Uh, these people have a captive labor organization in terms of captive by organized crime, and and they aim to hold on to it. Thank you. Charlene? Robin, we invited Mr. Fitzsimmons to appear on this program, but he said he couldn't make it tonight. Instead, we have the man who is representing him in connection with these charges, Mozart Ratner. Mr. Ratner is a Washington-based lawyer who has represented several Teamsters locals in the past. He has also served as Assistant General Counsel for the National Labor Relations Board. Mr. Ratner, do you um, have anything to say about Mr. Windrum's charges that the reason you are here is because Mr. Fitzsimmons doesn't want to face his accusers? Well, no. Uh, Mr. Fitzsimmons is not here simply because he had a prior engagement. But as far as facing his accusers, what well, the accusations against him don't warrant personal reply from him. The accusations are that he's breached fiduciary duty of one sort or another. Those are legal contentions and they should appropriately be answered mm -hmm. by a lawyer. All right. Well, Where prod acting in the capacity it purports to be acting as a legal accuser, it would be represented by competent legal counsel in making tenable accusations, which these are not. You're saying Mr. Windrum is not competent to make these accusations, or that Prod is? He is not competent to make accusations that are legally valid. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's go to some of the specifics he's talked about, particularly that Mr. Fitzsimmons has allowed the mob to infiltrate the union. Well, let me make a prior statement. Mr. Windrum has implied that the charges that they have now released the so-called 94-page Bill of Particulars are novel somehow. That is not true. They are stale. They were first published in May of 1976 in the so-called Prod Report, which with few exceptions is an even more elaborate statement than the charges of the allegations that they now have put in charge form. At the time they published that book, Mr. Fox, who was counsel for Prague, attributed the fact that the Teamsters did not rise up in arms and throw Mr. Fitzsimmons out of office to the fact that the Teamsters were ignorant of the data that Prague was publishing in its new report. They published it, mind you, just before the 1976 convention. They published it with a fanfare of media attention that couldn't have failed to come to the attention of every citizen of the United States who reads and listens to television and, and, and radio and reads a newspaper, let alone every Teamster. They went to the convention and they presented amendments to so-called, so according to them, reform the Teamster and the delegates voted the amendments down. Well, now those were delegates elected, if you please, 
voluntarily and democratically by the rank and file teamsters in every local union. They rejected Prod's claim that the matters that they were raising and the accusations they were making warranted cleanup, warranted changes in the Constitution, and warranted defeat of President Fitzsimmons. What these charges are is an attempt to override the membership's will and to impose a minority dictatorial regime and dictatorial minority standards. Well, how do you account? Team. All right, thank you. How, how do you account for the fact that they have made it back uh, in some fashion to the disciplinary panel? As Robin said, this is a rather unprecedented type of, of review, isn't it? Well, the Teamsters Constitution provides any member a right if he files charges that are specific enough to have a panel convened to hear and entertain those charges against an officer. Okay, let's move quickly then to a couple of the... And as a matter of fact, they filed those charges to keep this political propaganda campaign alive. This All is right. just a, a, a legal gambit to dress up the stale charges in a legal form. Okay, I think I understand your point on that. How about the specific charges, though? I think it was Business Week recently that stated that Mr. Fitzsimmons' salary is one of the highest in the country of any union official, $159,910 to be exact. Does that convert to a lavish lifestyle? I hadn't read, I thought I understood the charges pretty well, but it's, it happens. Uh, that's not a charge that's in the charges against President Fitzsimmons. Mm -hmm. I wish it were because there are quite a number of trade union officials of other unions uh, in this country whose salary and expenses uh, exceed $100,000. One approaches $140,000. You'll find that in Business Week for May 15th, the whole list of them, of May 15th of this year. Right. And their unions don't begin to approach within a million members the size of the Teamsters, and they don't begin to approach the complexity of the Teamster organization and begin remotely to compare with the difficulty and the complexity of the problems with which Mr. Fitzsimmons and his colleagues have got to co cope every day. All right, in a word, the charges of nepotism, hiring relatives, that he allowed the mob to infiltrate the union, are those charges, in a word, because we have to move on, substantial? Those ch charges, in my view, are frivolous. Thank you. Robin? Let's get another perspective on the Teamsters from a lawyer journalist who's been studying the union for several years. Stephen Brill, a columnist for Esquire magazine, is completing a book on the Teamsters to be published later this year. Mr. Brill, uh, since you've been studying the union, are all these charges that have come up in the Bill of Particulars, are they a compendium of stale old charges? Well, they're not exactly stale. Uh, there are some of them that uh, relate back to the book uh, that Prod did publish just prior to the convention. They have added more particulars to that, and I think um, uh, whatever you say about them, they're certainly charges worthy of a hearing, and um, it's not clear yet what kind of hearing they got or what kind of hearing they're going to get. Is Mr. Fitzsimmons' leadership threatened? Well, Mr. Fitzsimmons' leadership is probably threatened by, uh, by things um, in addition to those to uh, the charges that Prod has raised. My best guess about what will happen to the Prod charges is simply that the hearing will de uh, the hearing officers will decide, oh, probably in the fall, that uh, the charges are without foundation and the charges will be dismissed. Under uh, the labor law as it's now written, there isn't really a lot that Prod can do with that if, in fact, there is anything that they should do with that. Mr. Fitzsimmons' leadership, however, um, is threatened more so by the fact that there are many people who are just below him um, who would like to be president of the union. It's threatened by the fact uh, that as far as I can tell uh, there are all kinds of investigations of him uh, that are going on now. Now, um, of course, uh, they've been going on in the past, but they seem to be These making some progress. These are Justice and Labor Department ones which Secretary Marshall has recently said they're going to press actively. Well, particularly some um, investigations in the Justice Department uh, which, uh, you know, which have been reported in uh, the Times and elsewhere. Let me, let me ask you this. From their public image, corruption, and this may be unfair, but it just seems that way from seeing the media, uh, corruption charges seem almost a way of life for the Teamsters. Uh, what, what shape are the Teamsters actually in as a union? What well, services? Well, you're right. In a sense, it is unfair because the Teamsters union is uh, 742 locals around the country. 
Many of those locals, probably the majority of those locals, are run by very honest people who would stand probably the greatest temptations that any people in uh, the private sector have to stand um, in terms of holding them a trust for many people who are their members. Um, in that sense, the reputation is unfair. However, when you look at the leadership of the union at the very top, it's hard for them not to have that reputation, and it's certainly hard for them not to have that reputation when they respond to um, a television program such as yours by, by uh, deciding that uh, their spokesman is going to be uh, the uh, defense lawyer who is hearing who is uh, defending uh, the charges against Mr. Fitzsimmons. Well, to be fair to Mr. Fitzsimmons, we only asked him yesterday when we decided to do this, so um, perhaps, he, perhaps he is uh, otherwise occupied this evening. Um, let me ask you this. Is um, uh, the public affected by the way the Teamsters Union is run, or is this only a matter that concerns the people who are members of the union? Well, they're certainly affected in the sense that any kind of uh, corruption in a labor union probably drives up prices of the product which the union um, is dealing with. If, uh, you know, if uh, the Teamsters in New Jersey are involved um, in hijacking trucks or televisions, rather, uh, you know, that um, are loaded onto trucks, if they're hijacking liquor or whatever, that's obviously going to drive up the price of those products. The other way that it affects the public, though, is that it shakes confidence in all labor unions, and it shakes confidence in uh, the public's perception of uh, the government's ability to deal with corruption in labor unions. If you look at the track record of the government attempting to tame corruption in a union such as the Teamsters, you have to, you know, uh, you almost have to throw up your hands. It's, it, um, it has been very difficult. There are severe weaknesses in the law, and. Um, it doesn't look like they're going to be changed in the near future. Well, thank you. Charlene? And now for the views of a man who has been a Teamster for 28 years. He is R.V. Durham, head of Teamster Local 391 in Greensboro, North Carolina. Mr. Durham is also Director of Health and Safety for the Teamsters International. Mr. Durham, why do you, in your view, are the Teamsters always in so much trouble? Well, as you mentioned, I've been a Teamster for 28 years, and as long as I can recall, uh, we've always been the, the whipping boy as far as the media. I guess that's the reason being is because we're the largest, and I guess uh, the anti-labor forces would um, naturally like to destroy us first. Do you and include in those anti-labor forces the government and the investigations they've conducted? Well, no, I would not include uh, possibly some of the individuals maybe that are with government as far as their philosophical views, but uh, you have to keep in mind uh, that uh, we're an organization of two million members and 800 local unions. And as already been mentioned, uh, we do have our own autonomous rights. But uh, it concerns me when statements are made that uh, with the leadership. There's not a person on our general executive board that has any criminal record. And so I think that the problem we have is that too many people assume that a person is guilty when they're just charged. Let's let uh, everybody have their day in court and let's, let's stay with the American way of life. The person's innocent until proven guilty. All right, what is your opinion of Mr. Uh, Fitzsimmons? Is his leadership threatened uh, by these uh, vocal dissidents? No. Uh, we've had uh, rump groups for ever since I've been a Teamster. The other unions have uh, dissident groups. Uh, they'll come and they'll go. Uh, today it's pride, tomorrow it's something else. Uh, they is, do that, not is that a view that you, you feel the rank and file shares certainly with it, you? It was, it was expressed at the convention in 1976 when, as already been mentioned, uh, these uh, pride reformed uh, proposals were completely defeated by elected officers, the same as myself, and I have to stand for election every three years, and I have to be responsible to my 9,000 members. And so if I don't speak the will of my people, then uh, they will make a change. Well, in your view, how, how strong is this movement, this dissident movement? Are they having any impact? Well, the, they're, all they're doing is, uh, of course, is getting the attention of the news media. They seem to be able to uh, get TV and uh, newspapers. But, uh, but the charges they, that they've been bringing against uh, Mr. Fitzsimmons don't concern uh, you and the rank and file. No, they came in into general. my local a few months ago trying to stir up unrest in my local. Uh, but... Uh, uh, we, we don't view it, uh, you know, 6,000 members, that's only half the size of my local union. And here we're talking about 2 million members. 
All right. What about uh, charges that both the Labor Department, the Justice Department possibly, and the uh, Pride Movement have made, like the mismanagement of the pension fund? Uh, do, do those kinds of things concern the rank and file in your, in, at all? Uh, I'm sure that any time a person reads adverse publicity about their organization, whether it's church, organization, whatever, they, they become concerned. But keep in mind, uh, in my local union alone, I have 900 members join retirement of $450, $550 a month through the same pension fund that has been so criticized in, in the newspapers and the television. So uh, as long as those members get their check at the first of the month, they know who's telling the truth. And our pension that's, fund... That's the measurement. That's right. The, our, our members measure by performance and not by promises as pride is, is attempting to make. And it is of no concern to your membership that Mr. Fitzsimmons does enjoy a handsome salary and... Uh... Well, you know, uh, you know, the salary, uh, let, let's talk about that just for a second. Uh, you know, uh, I was just reading where uh, uh, local television uh, commentaries here in Washington are drawing in excess of what uh, Mr. Fitzsimmons is making and they read the news 15 minutes twice a day. Uh, I don't think that our members uh, resent Mr. Fitzsimmons being paid well. He, he heads up an organization of two million members. He makes very, very important decisions, and if he makes the wrong decision, it has an adverse effect. So uh, I have not detected any resentment among our members or officers that uh, he's been overpaid. All right. Thank you. Robin? Yes. Uh, Mr. Windrum, what is your reaction to the uh, remarks of Mr. Ratner and Mr. Durham rather poo-pooing the importance of your prod movement and its charges? Well, to, to put it uh, quite politely, I think uh, it's a lot of baloney. There are, there are first of all, let, let's, let's go back to Mr. Ratner's statement. Charlene asked him uh, with regard to the organized crime infiltration. Did he believe that this was, that this was uh, true? And he made a preliminary statement which took up the, all of the time. If Mr. Ratner uh, wants to say that Anthony Provenzano's control of Teamster Union activities in New Jersey is frivolous, well, that's his problem and it's, and it's his, his morality that, that, you know, that I question. If he wants to talk in terms of, of uh, the Teamsters Union in New Jersey, if he wants to talk in terms of 11 11 Teamster locals in New Jersey that have had dealings with organized crime figures, and I'm not just talking about associations, I'm talking about people who have been identified by competent law enforcement agencies as members of organized crime, high-ranking members of organized crime. As far as what, uh, what Mr. Durham said about us going down to stir up trouble with regard to his local, we were asked down there by the 300 members of PROD in Local 391. And those people down there were obviously not very excited about Mr. Durham's activities either. So whereas he may have a great deal of happiness down there with those people who are receiving $450 and $550 a week, there are still the matter, there is still the matter of $200 million in uncollectible and shaky loans that that pension fund admits to on its report. And we haven't had an independent audit yet which the, the Teamster Central States Pension Fund uh, has not been cooperating with, uh, according to testimony before the House Ways and Means Oversight Subcommittee. Let's, let's separate those two things. Mr. Ratner, do you want to respond on the, uh, on the allegations about organized crime in New Jersey? Yes, and I want to respond by starting with the misconception that underlies... Uh, Mr. Ratner, could I just ask you to make your response as brief as possible so that everybody will have a chance to come in? Yes. Congress passed the Landrum-Griffin Act in 1959 in response to allegations against Jimmy Hoffa and the Teamsters, which were at least as reckless and as least as severe, at least as uh, uh, appropriate as the charges that are leveled, any of the charges that are leveled against the Teamsters today and against President Fitzsimmons. In enacting legislation to cope with that problem at the instigation of the McClellan Committee and the press and others, Congress decided that it had to balance two things. One was the methodology of allowing union members to clean their own houses and establish the morality that appealed to them, and two, not to impinge upon local union and national union autonomy. How, independent. How is that relevant in a word to the, to the charge about New Jersey? The charge about New Jersey is simply an attempt to say that because 
the accusation is made that Tony Provenzano is affiliated with or is a member of organized crime, someone outside the union ought to remove him or that there is a duty upon the union's president to remove him even though he was elected to an office there by his a, local membership. There is a constitutional duty that Mr. Fitzsimmons has apparently ignored and the constitutional duty relates to the trusteeship uh, provisions of the Constitution by which Mr. Pro Mr. Fitzsimmons has the right and not only that according to the Constitution, the constitutional requirement to remove those Teamster officials who he feels are playing games with the money of the union. Now, Mr. Fitzsimmons, in spite of Mr. Provenzano's conviction in 1963, in spite of his, of his uh, obvious uh, problems with the law since then, in spite of the conviction in 1978, in spite of uh, various things that have been brought to light, Mr. Fitzsimmons has done nothing with regard to Local 560 in Union City, New Jersey. And not only that, but when Mr. Provenzano was getting back into Union office in November 1975, he had a testimonial dinner at which the guest speaker was Frank E. Fitzsimmons, a convicted extortionist. If, of Mr. Union Windrum, funds. if Mr. Windrum will point to the provision of the Teamster Constitution that provides that a, an elected union be removed from office because he has been accused of crimes other and including taking money from the Union Treasury of which I understand Mr. Provenzano has not been accused of. Yeah, he's happens. convicted of taking money from employers to ensure labor peace. And as it happens the Department of Labor does not believe that that conviction is a disqualification from holding Union office even for five years. Well, Mr. Ratner, Mr. Ratner and uh, Mr. Widner, I have to stop you both there and I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to go into the pension fund thing but uh, fascinated by this argument going on here. Thank uh, if you. I just, if I may add one word, the pension charges well, have I'm been excluded from the hearing. There, there is, uh, yes, quite, I understand that point. Thank you all gentlemen in Washington and good night Charlene. Good night. Thank you Mr. Brill.